Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam This is the fourth class of this series What is Sufism? And tonight I want to talk about the historical development of Sufism with particular focus on the rise of the Sufi order of the Tariqa. So this is what I'd like to talk about. One of the things that the Sufis say is a Sufi ibn waqtihi. The Sufi is the son of his time. <coughs> and this expression has many different meanings. In fact, perhaps the most basic meaning of it is that the Sufi lives in the present moment. He lives in the present, not in a past that has disappeared and not in an illusory future. And that also in his or her present moment, whatever state that God has put them in, they seek to fulfill that state in the fullest way to understand it, to understand God's wisdom in it, and to benefit from it in the fullest. Whether that state is one of bust, in which you have expansion and lightness and joy, or whether it's one of qab, of contraction, when you have heaviness and difficulty, whatever it might be. So the waqt also is the hal. But this expression means more than that too because what it means is that the Sufi is relevant to his time and in fact that relevance to his time is because of the fact that he's in it he's not in some imaginary world he's not in some future that doesn't exist he's not in his expectations or anticipations nor is he in the regrets of a past or anything like that. He's in the present moment. So, um, part of this is the fact that in the history of Islam, the Sufis, and of course we're here when, when we're using the word Sufis here, I'm using the word of authentic Sufis, the ones that deserve that name. But throughout history, you see that they rise to the need of the time. And they accomplish incredible things. And we'll look at some examples of that tonight, inshallah. And maybe you could say they do what no one else can do. When the Prophet described the wali of Allah, as we saw last night, he says, يَخْرُجُونَ min kulli غَبْرَا مُظْلِمَةً that they come out of every impossible situation and every difficult situation they will find a way out and that would be true of them themselves in their lives that they lead but then also it's true of them in the context of their societies and that's why when the Muslim society respects them and honors them but then also is competent in the way that it deals with them so that <clears throat> it uh, holds them to their standards and it's not easily deluded by charlatans and fools as is often the case in many parts of the Muslim world just as we have people who are very suspicious of the Sufis and very wary of them you have other people that are not at all and they're often the victims of being led astray by people who are not worthy of that name. But when Muslims take them as a source of guidance, then great good will come. Because They will come out of every difficult trial. They'll find a way out. And if you're with them, they will take you out too. So the rise of the Sufi order is a very good example of that, that the Sufi is the son of his time. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. 
because in a way the Sufi order arises in history and that is with Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani the orders all begin with him but it, it is to save the Ummah and to bring it back together and to order it properly and to get it back on its feet and to spread love and to spread sincerity and so forth so um, this is because that's what that time needed because the caliphate now was dysfunctional it was doing nothing and so then the order comes in and it begins to do miraculous things under the direction of Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani. So tonight, to begin with, um, let's talk about the first 550 years of Islamic history, which is the first 500 years of the history of the Sufis also, because they go back to the very beginning. And um, I want to preface that by talking about three words, Sharia, Tariqa, and Haqiqa. Sharia is the prophetic law and all of its massive greatness, all of its profundity, all of its depth. And Tariqa, well, let's say Haqiqa first. Haqiqa is a word that we've used many times now, and you knew it anyway. You've used it before. But the haqiqa is the ultimate truth of things, the ultimate realities of things, as God knows them to be. The first principles of creation. Okay, this is what we call haqiqa. And then we have the word tariqa. So we have sharia, we have tariqa, and we have haqiqa. Now, these words were used from very early on, maybe from the beginning, I don't know, I'm not able to say. But what's very important is that the word tariqa didn't mean Sufi order. In the early period, and after that also, the basic meaning of tariqa is path, it's a way. And what kind of a way is it? It is a path that is designed to take you from Sharia to Haqiqa, and from Haqiqa to Sharia. It is the Isthmus. Did I say that right? Isthmus. That's a very hard word to say in English. I shouldn't have any trouble with it. But it is the Hamzat al Wasl. It is the link between Sharia and Haqiqa. It's the lifeline between Sharia and Haqiqa. It's what enables you to go from the one to the other. And therefore the Tariqa is always methodology. And it involves a particular way of worship, a particular way of behavior. And the Tariqa can be many different types. In fact, it's going to be many different types because of the fact that the tariqa is designed to take you from sharia to haqiqa, but then who are you? And what are you? And where do you live? And what is your situation? And what is your problem, if you have one? So the tariqa will be designed for you. And for that reason, it's also said that there are as many tariqas. Let me write this down. You, you, let's give you a respite. Those are breaths. So they say there are as many tariqas as there are breaths. And they don't mean by that Sufi orders. <laughs> but what they mean by that is that um, as there are different breaths, then the methodology is as different as that because although we have common methodologies that are beneficial to us all, maybe the way we apply it to you is not the way we apply it to her or to him or to others. But here the word tariqa is referring to the methodology, the particular approach that will be taken, a particular dhikr that might be done, a particular uh, stance on 
fasting maybe every Monday and Thursday, or even more than that, or less than that, or whatever. Okay, so that's originally what tariqah means. It doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with uh, the order, the Sufi order. And that's the way it will be for the first 550 years, roughly speaking, until the time of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. So the Sufis have many turuq. And, of course, even when we talk about Sufi orders, they have a number of them. And those orders have a number of varieties within them also. And often those varieties are due to different times, different places, different challenges, different ethnic groups, different languages, and different backgrounds and all sorts of things. Okay, the haqiqa is one. And of course the sharia is one too, except that in the sharia we will have different madhabs. And the madhab itself is actually a methodology. It's a way of proceeding, a way of going. And Imam Abu Hanifa has a unique methodology. Part of it, for example, is ta'amimul adilla the generalization of legal proofs. And then he has the great student Abu Yusuf. And Abu Yusuf is almost the same, but not quite. And then you have Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani. And he's very similar, but not so, not exactly the same. So you have differences even there in the Hanafi school. But they have a particular approach to the understanding of Sharia. Imam al-Shafi'i, Allah be pleased with him, also has a methodology which he spells out very carefully for reading the law and applying the law. Imam Malik and the people of Medina, they have a different approach. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal has even a different approach from that. So they have different approaches. The Sharia is one and vast, but there are different schools. But the Sufis say we have one madhab. They have many turuq. They have many approaches to that madhab. And they have different methodologies. But the basic truths are all the same. And um, they also are proud of the fact, and they state that no one else can boast of that. That they have consensus on their basic principles, the basic truths, on the haqqaiq. And again, if we want to go into that in some detail, we could see that, no, they do differ on certain things. For example, we said yesterday that Ibn Arabi believed that the abdal, the substitutes, who are very special saints, can also be women. And they didn't all agree to that. What is is what is. I don't know what it is. But, so they do have differences on points like that. But they don't have substantial differences you know, on the haqqaiq, and, and they're all saying the same thing. And if you go through the literature of the Sufis, it's really remarkable. They, they, it's like they, they all have this unified, unitary vision of God and his relationship to the world and of the haqqaiq they talk about and so forth. And they express it in different ways. So this is one of the things that we say that Sufism is a single truth, but it has different approaches, many different approaches. They would say as many as the breaths of human beings. But what they're after and what they believe in, that's one, that they agree on. So the first period, the first 550 years, is a brilliant period. And this is when these great names appear that just the mention of them is a huge baraka. Mercy comes down just from, and of course the ones that come after that are like that too. But the real famous ones like Al Junaid al Salik, Abu Yazid al Bistami, uh, Sahl al Tustari and Rabi' al adawiya These people are from that early period. And one of the things to note about them is they don't have Sufi orders. 
none of them has an order. They, now they do have disciples, they do have companions, they do teach, but it's not the same as having an order. The order is quite different. The order is in fact broader than that. And some of them, I believe this is true of Sahil at Tustari, God be pleased with him, that they say that the wa'id at the mosque in Basra, the storyteller at the mosque or the admonisher at the mosque, the mosque will be filled. And he's talking and the people are weeping and crying and laughing. And you go to the circle of Sahil at Tustari and there's seven people. So he doesn't have a big following, although he's one of the greatest human beings who ever was. So this first period then is a period of great um, teachers and great masters, and uh, they have a great deal of independence, and they move around a lot. They do take students, they do teach, they leave an incredible legacy, and, um, but they don't have turuk, they don't have orders. And um, I just mentioned some names here, since there's a lot of baraka in mentioning them, I might go through them. But and these are very few actually. But in the first, in the second century, for example, you have Al Hasan Al Basri. So this man is absolutely amazing, and the legacy that he leaves to us, uh, only God knows the richness of it and the benefit that it's brought. And so he belongs to that period, the earliest part of it. In fact, he's one of the first voices. Ma'ruf al-Karhi, that we talked about before. Ibrahim al-Adham, Ibrahim ibn Adham. Rabi al-Adawiyah, al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, Abu Yazid al-Bistami, Sahl al-Tustari. Um, now, uh, these are people in that first century, second century, now we've gone into third, just giving some names. Now, with Sahel, you have uh, writing about Sufism. Not that he's the first to do that, but among these he is. So none of these will write books, at least not to our knowledge. But Sahel ibn Abdullah at Tustari, he writes a tafsir. In that tafsir, he transmits from Ja'far al-Sadiq and from others. And his tafsir is a beautiful tafsir, but it's also a Sufi tafsir. So you have the writing, and then he has also works on wilaya, on sainthood. So this is also a period when writing about Sufism appears. And many of the great classical works will be written in this first 550 years. Especially works that will define for us what is Sufism, what is wilaya, what is the path like, Things like that. And then, uh, right after Sahel, uh, very soon, you know, comes, and he's of the same generation, is the Imam. So you have all this activity, all of this great work and production, and then you have Al Imam Abu Al Qasim Al Junaid ibn Muhammad Al Sadiq. So he is the Imam of the Sufis. And the Imams of the Sharia are. Abu Hanifa, Malik, Al Shafi'i, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and we could mention Al Layth ibn Sa'ad and Sufyan al Thawri and others, but those four, those are the great Imams. And then in Aqidah, you have Al Ash'ari, you have Al Maturidi, and you also have the Athari school, which is before them and after them as well. And so you have different Imams in the Sharia and in the Aqidah, but in uh, Sufism, you have one Imam, Al Junaid al Salik. There's no one that competes with him in that. He is regarded as the authority. And again, as Al-Haddad, who was one of his great contemporaries, there are many Haddads in Islamic history, Al-Imam Al-Haddad, but he comes much later. But Al-Haddad said that if intellect, Al-Aqal, which as you heard yesterday, is the essence of Rujula, and Muru'a, and Futuwa. But if Aqal had a human face, it would look like Junaid. I mean, he was beautiful, and he was brilliant beyond words. Absolutely. And, and his brilliance 
showed on him. And he's the Imam. He also writes, by the way, not to my knowledge a great deal, but there are Rasail and other things from Imam al Junaid. Uh, also, in this period, first period, um, moving on into the fourth century, you have uh, Abu Bakr Shibli. And I think in Egypt you know who he was, right? A Shibli. He's a beautiful man. He's called the crown of God's people. Taj, yani ahlillah. He's the crown of God's people. Um, and Imam al Junaid is the one who named him that. And um, there's the beautiful story of a Shibli, you know, that um, a Falaha peasant woman had a metaphysical question of the first order that, you know, when, when you harvest wheat or you harvest fool or anything else in those days when everything was organic, there are going to be worms in which you harvest, right? This man knows what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> and, um, you know, so she was amazed by this mystery that when we grind the wheat, no worms remain. But when we grind the fool, there's still worms. So she has to know, how is this? Why is this? Must be a big secret. So they sent her to the great Abu Bakr al-Shibri. And um, maybe they did that for fun. I don't know why they did it. But he said to her, he told her, Man sahib al-kibara salim. <laughs> Man sahib al kibara salim. Whoever keeps the company of the big ones, the great ones, he'll be safe. So the difference between the fool worm, you know, and the wheat worm is that the fool worm's not a fool, right? <laughs> and uh, because the fool bean is big, then a lot of them survive. That's really beautiful, and of course it's very funny. It's very Egyptian also. <laughs> You know, but at the same time, um, it also reflects the other reality of the Sufis that all creation is their shaykh. And they see the truths of God in everything. Even in the fact that when you grind fool, some worms remain there. And when you grind wheat, none do, because they all get ground. The wheat is small, they all get ground. So, um, this is a, a beautiful example of that. They see truth in all the things around them. All creation speaks to them. Um, and they get wisdom from it all. Uh, in this period also you have uh, Abu Nasr al-Sarraj at Tusi. Um, he's 4th century, so we've moved along. We're not going to take a history lesson here, although it would be beautiful to do it. And this is the end of the 10th century. And Abu Nasr uh, al-Sarraj, um, you know, this is a man who writes, uh, again, and a very important book, which is Kitab al-Lum'a fi tasawwuf Kitab al-Lum'a, uh, The Radiances, regarding Tasawwuf. It's a beautiful book, and it was... It's been in the market now for a long time. Sheikh Abdul Halim Mahmoud, Allah Yarhamuhu, he edited it. And uh, it's a really good book, precious book. And again, in this, he's going to tell you about Tasawwuf. But also in this, uh, you'll find, for example, one of the clearest warnings about the false Sheikh that you'll ever find. And he makes it very clear that this is always a problem. And he makes it very clear that you are responsible for the choice you make in who you follow. And you cannot just lightly turn yourself over to someone who's not worthy of that. So you have to pick your shaykh carefully. So he talks about how do you know him, how do you do that. It's a really important book. Also, just to take a few names, in this period, the end of the 4th century, the end of the 10th century of the Common Era, um, you have Al-Kalabadi. Al-Kalabadi. Um, 
And al Kalabadi is very important. He was from Bukhara because he wrote Kitab at Ta'aruf bi Madhab at Tasawwuf. This is a book that, like uh, As Sarraj, it's going to tell us like what is Sufism and what is it not also. And, and yet it's compared to the book of As Sarraj, it's more like a manual. It's more like, it's more basic, it's a beautiful, beautiful book, and uh, it's one of those great works of that time. Also, not long after that, uh, in fact, in the same century, uh, the contemporary of al Kalabadi and As-Sarraj and of, um, and, uh, you know, uh, and of um, Shibli, in fact, uh, Abu Talib al-Makki, he also writes about Tasawwuf. But again, uh, and he writes Qut al-Qulub, which is one of the great works, the nourishment of the hearts. Qut al-Qulub. Imam al-Ghazali would depend very heavily on Qut al-Qulub when he writes the Ihya ulum al din So again, these are incredible works. And these are works that are spelling out what is the path, where are the dangers, how do you know the shaykh, uh, what is the science of Ihsan. That's really what they're doing. Again, though, there's no tariqah in the sense of a Sufi order. That's still not there. It's also in this time, a little bit later, in the 5th century, which is the 11th century of the Common Era, that you have Abu Nu'aym al-Isfahani, and, of course, he writes that great book, Hilyat al-Awliya, the ornamentation of the awliya, which is, I believe my copy is 10 volumes, is yours 10 volumes? <laughs> but uh, it's a beautiful work. And in this, of course, he's writing about Tasawwuf, but the main thing that he's doing now is a biographical dictionary, bringing together the stories of all these incredible men and women. And then also he uh, transmits lots of hadith. And the muhaddithin will use Hilyat al-Awliya as one of the sources of hadith. Um, he can be trusted in his transmission of the Isnads. Of course, the Isnad itself has to be checked. Uh, also, as we go further into that 5th century, the 11th century, you have the great uh, Al-Hujwairi. Al-Hujwairi or Al-Hujwairi. And uh, he's called in um, Urdu, Data Ganj Bakhsh. So he is the great Sheikh of the subcontinent. And uh, he writes a book called Kashf al Mahjub, which he writes in Persian, by the way. So here you have uh, also the rise of Persian literature. And this is one of the early works in Persian literature. And it's beautiful Persian. <clears throat> and it's also translated into Arabic in a very, very excellent uh, Arabic translation. But this is a book which does what those other books do that spells out what is the path, how does it work, uh, what are the paradoxes of the path, what are the paradigms of the path, and, and that's a great book. I don't believe that you can read it without falling in love with it. al Qushayri also is of this same time, al Qushayri, and he writes the Risala, al Qushayriya, and then you have the last one I'm going to mention, in this period of the first 550 years is the great Abu Hamid Muhammad bin Muhammad al-Ghazali, uh, you know, who wrote the great book Ihya Ulum al-Din, which is one of the greatest books ever written, and one of the most subtle books ever written. And then, of course, he wrote many other things as well. And since we're speaking about Sufism, one of the works that we should mention here is Al-Munqidh min al-Dalal. Um, you know, deliverance from error. And this is a bio an autobiography, as you know, and beautiful beyond words, in which Al-Ghazali tells you about himself. And he tells you about his spiritual dilemma. And uh, as one of the greatest teachers and professors in the Muslim world, and yet, even though he was this great teacher, this brilliant mind, uh, he goes through a period of doubt and misgiving, and then he will take his spiritual path. 
in order to find certainty and that will bring him back home. So this is an incredible thing. So this is now sort of the um, crossroads. This is sort of the, you know, the landmark because at the time of Imam al-Ghazali you have uh, these other developments now taking place which will manifest themselves in the tariqa as Sufi order. Imam al-Ghazali doesn't have a tariqa, and he is a Sufi. Kitab Ihya Ulum al actually is not a book of Sufism. Um, it is a book of mu'amala. It's a book of practice of how to live sincerely, how to believe sincerely, how to practice sincerely, how to purify the heart, and to know the heart, and to know how it works, and to know the nature of evil, and the nature of good. And he talks about dhikr and many things. But those of you who've read in or read this beautiful, beautiful book, you know that he will always draw the distinction in it uh, between ilm, al-mu'amala, and ilm al-mukashafa. The ilm al-mu'amala is the science of practicing this religion, living this religion, uh, transacting with people, transacting with yourself, transacting with others. And uh, that's the basis. If you don't have ilm al-mu'amala, you will not have ilm al-mukashafa. And many, many times he'll tell you in the Ihya that Ilm al-Mu'amala will take you now to the door of Mukashifa. I'm not going through that door in this book. If you want to go, that's up to you. If you want to go, that's up to you. But So it's an incredible work. And also because it's Ilm al-Mu'amala, then it's written for all Muslims, whether they want to take the spiritual path or they don't want to take the spiritual path. And it is one of the greatest revivers of the deen through history that any civilization has ever seen, that we've ever seen, or that any civilization has ever seen. Um, so, if you were to, and of course, Az Zabidi has a beautiful commentary on this, which is called uh, Ithaf al Sadat al Muttaqeen. Um, Az Zabidi comes from Zabid, actually, he comes from, I believe, around Burma or Bangladesh. Uh, then his family went to Yemen, to Zabid, and where did Zabidi actually live? In Cairo. <laughs> so he's your guy. He's your guy. He actually lived here, and he wrote here, and he was a contemporary of al qutb al dirdir So they are right there together in the 18th century. And Zabidi is fantastic. I mean, he's one of these great scholars who like embraces the entire intellectual and spiritual history of Islam. And Hadith, he's a Muhaddith, and Quran. And so his commentary on the Ihya is just a treasure that cannot be measured. And how beautiful it would be if we could just spend all of our time studying the Ihya with Zabidi. I would love that more than anything else. It's so rich. And one of the things about the Ihya is that people who read it once, they've got to read it twice. People who read it twice, they've got to read it three times. And the more you read it, the more you get. And again, the more you see the subtleness of the intellect and the heart of Imam al-Ghazali. He writes the Ihya after he comes home, after his journey. Okay, so now with Imam al-Ghazali, um, we come to that generation of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, because they are contemporaries. Uh, Al-Ghazali is older. He's older by, I can tell you in a few minutes, but um, We'll, we'll wait a few minutes for that. But they're all at that same time. And the Ihya is doing what? It's bringing the Ummah back to life. And so what will Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani do? He will seek to do that. 
And he uses the manhaj of Imam al-Ghazali and of Ahmad al-Ghazali, who is Imam al-Ghazali's younger brother. So Imam al-Ghazali, Imam Ahmad al-Ghazali, Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, um, you know, these are gifts that were given to the Ummah and they will produce the big changes that bring about the rise of the Sufi order. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Before we do that though, you know, we did talk here about the writing of books. And uh, I just want to say a little bit about that, about the writing of literature on Sufism and in Islam, in Sufism. So, um, most Islamic literature, in terms of volume, is about hadith. We have huge volumes of hadith literature, of course, of commentary, tafsir as well, uh, law. And some people would say that Muslims wrote about nothing as much as they wrote about law. I presume that to be true. I don't have statistics. I presume that to be true. But if indeed Muslims wrote about law more than they wrote about anything else, perhaps even hadith, perhaps even tafsir, uh, right up there, number two or three, is going to come, Suf is going to come Sufism. Because Sufism also was that theme that Muslims were most fascinated with. And then, this would be in the Arab world, in the Arab-speaking world, or the Arab-writing world. If we leave the Arab world, and we go into the Turkish world, the Persian world, the vast world of the Persian language, um, the world of Urdu, and of the languages of, of uh, the subcontinent, excuse me, the um, languages of Nusantara, uh, Javanese, and Malay, and so forth, or we go into China, or, and the Chinese Muslims, or we go into uh, parts of Africa, and then, let's say, into Bosnia, or European Islam, Tatar Islam, their Sufism is going to be number one. It will be number one. And especially in the Persian language, you have productions that are beyond words. They have no peer. Poets. Um, we're going to also talk tonight, even, about Sufism and Shiism, Sufism and Ahl al-Bayt. I want to say just a few things about that. And uh, I hope that there's no sense of sectarianism or animosity in what I say. But for the record, we should note that that Persian literature that is produced um, in poetry and in prose about Sufism and other things as well, it is overwhelmingly Sunni. It is, and I just point that out because if you don't know the history of Islam very well, you might think that was Shi'i, and if it was, well, there wouldn't be any problem with that necessarily. But that was not the case, and the Iranians know that very well. Uh, Iran is a bastion of Sunni Islam until the 16th century, until the 1500s, until the time of Shah Ismail, a Safawi. So um, this great production of Sufi literature in Persian, it is Sunni literature. And that's just for the record. I say that just for the record. Um, now, the Sufis produced incredible books, incredible poetry, and um, yet at the same time, the Sufis make it very clear that Sufism is not taken from books, and it's not taken from poetry, and it's not taken from any form of writing. Uh, Sufism has to be taken from its people. It's got to be taken through the living transaction of keeping company with the Sufis. That's where you get it. So the books, you know, are aids. The books are helpers. 
They're there to enable you to see what's in front of your eyes. They're there to enable you to imbibe what is there and to get it. And in fact, the Sufis themselves say in some of their literature that the things we write are written, maybe a paragraph, maybe a chapter, to save you 70 years. You could have figured it out yourself, but it would take you 70 years. Uh, some of us would never figure it out e anyway. But So this is just to speed you along the way, but you need to be on the way. And you need to have uh, these people there that you learn from and that you take from. And writing poetry, aphorisms, these beautiful things they say, uh, aphorisms, you know, are these short statements like al-ghayra uh, and ta'rif wa ta'raf, that's an aphorism. Ghayra, honor, the defensive honor is that you know and not be known, that you know God and not be known by people as knowing God. Okay, so these are beautiful, but they are pearls, and they are drops of an ocean. They're drops of water, um, but they're not the sea itself, and they shouldn't be mistaken, you know, for the sea itself. So the words of the Sufis, the books of the Sufis, are guidelines and waymarks, and they're to help you along the path, and to speed you along the path. And also, for this reason, they never get old, and for this reason also, they never get out of date. And for this reason also, we don't necessarily have to have a production of new works to take their place. Because, again, the realities they're talking about don't change. And those realities are not like the realities of fiqh. Of course, in fiqh, you have dawabit and thawabit and qawa'id and hudud. In fiqh, the application of Islamic law, fiqh applied Islamic law with wisdom. You have things that are fixed, hudud, limits that are set. You have thawabit and so forth. You know, but of course, fiqh has always got to be triangulating itself with the social, political, economic, cultural reality of the time it lives in. And this is one of the greatest obligations of the mujtahid. Um, of course, the Sufis do that too. Uh, Sufi ibn Waqtihi, he is the son of his time. He's got to know his time. But the haqqaiq that give him life and the reality that he's imbibed, that doesn't change. That doesn't change. That stays the same. So therefore, you don't need a huge multiplicity of these books. And for that reason, a book like the Ihya, it will be beneficial for us until the end of time. No doubt, if you translate it, you know, then you have to sometimes explain to people the cultural context of it in the world of Imam al-Ghazali. But the realities it's talking about, those are for all times and places. So I say that uh, to emphasize what the Sufis believed, and that is that words that human beings speak or write or that they put into poetry, they are secondary. They are of secondary importance on the path. And they must not be mistaken for the path. And in fact, one of the definitions of the ignorant Sufi is the one who learned it from the books. That's one of the definitions, even of the false sheikh. Self-taught. Um, read the book, benefit from the book, but you've got to make that real by finding a master. And the master will turn that to gold and make that what it's supposed to be. So, the Sufis emphasize that writings are important, they are blessed, but they are not essential to the path. And there are cases of people coming to a path and taking the hand of a real sheikh and maybe saying, what's my first assignment? What book do I read first? And they might say, read the sheikh. You know, that's your first and last assignment. Read the Shaykh and try to understand him and understand what he's doing. 
We talk about al-fahmu anillah, understanding about God. Uh, al-fahmu anillah is that you try to understand how God works with you in your life. Whether the things in your life are good or bad, whether they're sweet or sour, whether they make you happy or sad, but understand what God is doing with you. That is a huge thing, and that is an ibadah, and that is a big accomplishment in wilaya. But also, just as we try to understand about God, we try to understand about the sheikh. Who is this man? You know, how does, how, you know, how is he, for example, if a question comes, how is he likely to answer this question? If a problem is presented, how is he likely to answer this? Why did he do that? Why did he do this thing? Why did he not allow me to do something? Why did he want me to do something else? Um, this is al-fahmu an awliya illa, understanding about the awliya. And this is also essential to the spiritual path because you need to understand you need to witness that miracle that's taking place in their hearts. And you need to be able to relate to it, and then maybe you get it too. Maybe it comes into your heart too. So um, writing is very important, but it's not essential, and it is secondary. Um, the Sufis say, words remain on the shoreline. Words remain on the shoreline. Okay, that means that they're not boats. They're not the boats. Although Rumi says, words are ships, but meanings are oceans. Words are ships, but meanings are oceans. And um, so his words are little boats that take you out in that ocean, but they're not the ocean. The ocean is below them and the little boat enables you to go out on it and inshallah to imbibe that truth which is there. Mm. Rumi speaks, um, he said, Rumi says also speaking about words and speaking about poems, what a beautiful poet he was. By the way, Rumi was a master of Persian poetry and he'd mastered, he'd memorized all of these great, great poets who were before him. And he loved to recite poetry. But one of the things that his sheikh, Shams at Tabrizi, did is to make him write and say, stop reciting other people's poetry. Recite your own, because yours is second to nothing. And that was hard for Rumi to make that step. That was hard, but then finally he did. Before that, in anything, he can recite to you from these great poets. And he knows the poetry, he loves the poetry, he can comment, he's a great scholar. But Shemps, no, you do your poetry. You, and so out of this comes the poetry of Rumi, which uh, is in a class all of its own. Rumi says, though, you have seen the form, but remain unaware of the meaning. You memorize the beautiful words, that's the form. But you're unaware of the meaning. If you are wise, he says, pick the pearl out of the shell and keep it. Dive down and get the pearl out of that shell and keep it for yourself. <clears throat> so the Sufis also say, um, okay, that, that's enough said about that. And let's see how we're doing with time. Disaster. Okay. Sorry? We're good? Thank you. Tonight we go to midnight. Right? Okay. Sorry, you're trapped. Um, okay, so then and uh, now we come to after the first 550 years. Okay, this is the 6th century. It's almost 600 years of Islam. And uh, now we come again to this amazing generation of Imam al-Ghazali. He dies in um, 505, 
the early 6th century. That is in the Common Era, a date you'll never forget. 1111. Okay? 1111. That's his death date. Allah have mercy on him. And then you have his younger brother, Ahmad al Ghazali. And Ahmad al Ghazali, he dies in 1126. Um, and then you have the great Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. Um, he will die in 1166. That's the year uh, 561. Uh, but Imam al Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, he will not begin to teach until two years after Imam al Ghazali dies. And about 10 years after. The uh, uh, ten years after Imam Al Ghazali dies, and about two years after Ahmad Ghazali dies. So, did he know them? Did he know them? Because he was hidden before that time, and they will pass before he begins to teach. But he did indeed know them. We know that he know that knew them. One of the reasons is because um, Abdul Qahir as Suhrawardi who is one of the students of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, he's also a student of Ahmed al-Ghazali. So um, we know that because this man, as Suhrawardi, is so close to Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani that there's no way Sheikh Abdul Qadir wouldn't have known about the Ihya and about the legacy of uh, Imam al-Ghazali and of Ahmed al-Ghazali. And these, both of them, are great, and both of them are writers of books. Both of them are revivers of the Ummah. And the, the way of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani then is said to be, by some scholars, a combination of the path of Imam al Ghazali and his brother Ahmed, and then also Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. So he, he, he takes that and he applies it. Um, and the Sufi order begins with. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani. Um, his dates, if you're interested, are 470 to 561. That would be of the Hijra, 5th century, 6th century, and that would be 1077 to 1165. Okay, what's going on at this time? This is the age of the First Crusade. Okay, uh, the Crusades have begun. The Crusades begin when Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani is just a little boy. And the Crusades begin in Spain and Portugal. What happened in Spain and Portugal is a crusade. And it is exactly the same crusade that would come uh, to this part of the world and attack this country and attack Palestine and Syria and attack Iraq and the whole area. So this is the age of the First Crusade. And the First Crusade was the most brutal and devastating of all the Crusades. And um, when Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani is a little boy, maybe a teenager, the city of Toledo falls in Spain, Tuleitila. This is the first victory of the Crusades. And one of the first major losses of Islamic civilization because once the city of Toledo falls, if the Muslims cannot get it back, they will not be able to hold Spain and Portugal. It will not be possible. And they knew that. Strategically, that's just the way it is. This is geopolitics. If you're going to have a Muslim population in Spain and Portugal, and they were about two-thirds of Spain and Portugal, and in most of that two-thirds where they were, they were often the majority by that time. They're a big population. But unless they have Toledo, they won't be able to hold it. It's one of those absolutely strategic geopolitical cities. And um, we're not here to talk about things like that, but uh, the Ottomans, for example, uh, who are really, really uh, beautiful beyond words, and there's a book that's come out recently called Under Osman's Tree, Under the Tree of Uthman. This is, and this is about the Ottoman Empire, how it protected ethnic groups and minorities, Jews and Christians 
and, and everyone. Because um, Uthman, the great founder of the Ottoman Empire, um, Ghazi Uthman, he had a dream that uh, a moon came out of the heart of his sheikh and then came into his heart. And then a beautiful sycamore tree grew up. So the sycamore tree was sacred in the Ottoman Empire. They planted them everywhere they went. And this huge sycamore tree grew up and it put out its branches in all directions and all the nations of the earth came to take refuge under that tree. That's the tree of Uthman. And that's one of the important, if you want to say, founding myths of the Ottoman Empire. We are the protectors of all people, of all nationalities, of all groups. And in fact, I've been uh, in, a, in Turkey, on, in Bursa, on the mountain there, and seen uh, a sycamore planted in the days of Ghazi Uthman. And it's huge, and they make sure nothing happens to it. They have tree doctors, they support it, it's beautiful, it's healthy, it's been there all these years. But um, the Ottomans, when they begin to conquer Hungary, they take 100 years to conquer Hungary. They could have done it much faster, but they do it very carefully, very slowly, very politically. So they can hold it. They're very wise in what they do, but the Ottomans understood in their expansion in Hungary that there was a strategic city which, if they did not take it, they would not hold Hungary. And that city was Vienna. Vienna. So the reason why the Ottomans wanted to conquer Vienna, which they tried on a number of occasions, was to hold Turkey. Because they knew that in that part of the world, to hold what they had, Vienna was the Toledo. Just as Toledo is necessary to hold Muslim Spain and Portugal, so Vienna would be necessary to hold Hungary and then those parts of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans. Um, this is a military lesson, so forgive me for that, you know, but the Ottomans never could take Vienna, could they? And again, I just have to tell you why. Because they're intelligent, that's why. Um, the Ottomans were the heirs of the Roman Empire. They were the conscious heirs of the Roman Empire. And therefore, they learn from the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire has imperial armies. And the imperial armies will always be causing civil war. So the Ottomans then understood that we won't have that. We will have one imperial army and no more. Now they had great armies but only one knockout army. And so therefore, to take Vienna, it's got to be the imperial army, and they have to get it to Vienna as early in the spring as they can. They've got to conquer the city, and they've got to get home before winter. And that's what they couldn't do. The Viennese knew that. All they have to do is hold out, and the Ottomans will go home. And this is for political reasons, and it's because the Ottomans were not willing to take the chance that they would rip themselves apart with civil war. Forgive me for that. Um, what do we say? Off the cuff remark or whatever. But in any case, now we come to the time of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani. And um, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani was foretold by Sayyid Nafisa here in Egypt, hundreds of years before his life. They're the same family. The, the children of Al-Hassan. And he was foretold also by Al-Hassan Al-Anwar, who is the father of Sayyidina Nafisa. She is his biggest karama, as they say. Um, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani was Shaykh Al-Islam. So when he, he was born in Nif, in Persia, on the Caspian Sea, uh, he's pure Ahlul Bayt, on his father's side, he's a Hassani. On his mother's side, he's a Husseini. Very high lineage. Um, but he's born in Persia. And um, he's born in a Hanbali region of Persia, by the way. Hanbali Shafi'i. Um, Persia at that time, as we said, is overwhelmingly Sunni. And uh, therefore, Persians were Shafi'is and they were 
Hanafis, and they were also Hanbalis, and they were also Zahiris, and they had a few Malikis, but most of them belonged to those schools. So he became Shaykh al-Islam. He was sent to the city of Baghdad when he was about 17 or 18 years old. His mother sent him. He was an orphan. He was raised by his mother and he was raised by his paternal aunt. Her name was Aisha and his mother was Fatima. They are a religious family, a scholarly family, a saintly family. He learns many, many things in his childhood and boyhood. But when he's a young man, his mother sends him to Baghdad. And she tells him, you'll never come home again. And she said, uh, these eyes will never see that beautiful face again. And she sends him, and she doesn't allow him to come home. She will send him gifts and she will send him money from time to time, but he has to go to Baghdad. Baghdad at that time is the center of the world, um, much of it anyway, and it's the center of the Muslim world. It's the seat of the Abbasid Caliphate, as you know. But um, it's also a city of immense corruption, immense corruption and political instability and decay. And in fact, uh, one of the great Malikis of Baghdad, we have Malikis of Baghdad and Malikis of Egypt, of course, who were the dominant ones in the school, and of the West, of Tunisia and of Spain and of Morocco. But, uh, Al-Qadi Abdul Wahhab was one of the great Malikis of Baghdad, and one of the last ones. And he said around this time, Baghdadun darun li ahli al-mali tayyibatun, wa li al-mafalisi daru al-danki wa al-diqi, dhalaltu hayrana amshi fi azzikatiha, ka'anniya mushafun fi bayti zindiqi. So he said, as you know, almost all of you, Baghdad is, um, you know, a beautiful place to be if you're rich. If you have money, you know, it's, it's a beautiful place to be. But if you have nothing, Darul Banki wa Diqi, it's a place of great uh, difficulty and hardship. I remained wandering around in its alleyways in a state of confusion, as if I were a copy of the Qur'an in a hypocrite's house. So Baghdad was in a horrible state, and it wasn't safe. There were robbers, there were gangs, and there was all kinds of corruption going on. Um, so this is where he'll be sent to, his mother said. And he didn't like Baghdad. He didn't want to go there. He wanted to leave, but this is where your work will be done. He goes there as a teenager in his late teens, and he will study for the next almost 40 years. And he's not known during that time. People will know him personally, but he's not a public figure at all. All this time is a time just of careful study. He masters uh, all the Islamic sciences, Arabic, the Quran, the recitations of the Quran, tafsir, hadith. Uh, he becomes a faqih and a mujtahid and a mufti in the Hanbali school and in the Shafi'i school. And he gave very good fatwas. And all these outward sciences, ilm al-khilaf and so forth, he masters them all. And so he was called Shaykh al-Islam. And he was acknowledged by the scholars of his time as the greatest of them all. In fact, they often would not just praise the greatness of his fatwas, but the speed with which he gave them. He's extremely intelligent and extremely gifted. So he's Shaykh al-Islam, but during these years, when he was known as a mutafaqqa, um, he also um, takes the Sufi path, and he has his sheikhs. And among the most important of his sheikhs is at Dabas, who was a Syrian refugee from the Crusades, and uh, at Dabas was a very tough sheikh. Uh, the stories about him, and I won't talk about them very long because we want to make some headway, but um, Debas would treat him very roughly in the beginning. And the murids around Debas, uh, the students of Debas perhaps I should say, you know, they would uh, call him Ya Faqih, 
of faqih, because that's what he is, he's studying law. And they say that uh, one cold day, and Baghdad was very often on the verge of starvation, by the way, so they didn't have much food, and so on one cold day, at Debas is going with his students to a particular mosque, and he's crossing one of the bridges of Baghdad. And um, so then Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani is there and he turns around to him and pushes him into the river. And it's freezing cold. And Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, he just tries to hold his books up. He's got his books, you know, doesn't want them to get wet. And then he has to get to the shore. They went on, they just walked on. They pushed him into the river. And then um, he comes to the shore and he has to, he said he, he made his, you know, uh, dunking in the river, uh, his ghusl, as it was Jumar, so he said he made the intention of ghusl. And he came out, and then he has to wring out his clothes, of course he can't show his nakedness, has to wring out his uh, overgarment, and then he has to catch up with them, and he doesn't catch up with them until they're already at the mosque, and he comes in the mosque, and they finish eating, and he's starving and freezing. And uh, the Shaykh said, we didn't save anything for you. And uh, that's not very nice, is it? He said, we didn't save anything for you. And then at this point, the Muris didn't like him anyway. And maybe they're jealous of him. So they become really harsh with him, more than ever before. Like, why do you come with us? Why do you stay with us? Why can't you, you know, why can't you take a, a, a signal? And uh, then at Debas, they say he became like a lion. And he told them, leave him alone. He said, I was testing him. You know, he will be your sheikh. I was testing him. And I found him to be a mountain. And then from that time on, the relationship changes. And at Debas, we'll be with Sheikh Abdul Qadir until just after, you know, he appears and begins to teach in public. So he's a master of the outward and a master of the inward. And he was called, by the consensus of the awliya, Sultan al-Awliya. And he was also called al-Qutub al-Ghawth. And in Persian and Turkish and Urdu, he's called Ghawthi A'zam, Ghawthi A'zam, the greatest Ghawth. And he's called Pire Dasti Gir, the sheikh who's, who uh, holds out his hand to give you and he's called uh, Rauth Baksh, the gift of Rauth, and so many things. Um, he's unquestionably among the greatest reformers in human history. And certainly he's unquestionably among the greatest reformers and renewers of the Ummah. Um, so he begins to teach in Baghdad in the year 521. This is again shortly after the death of Ahmed al-Ghazali, uh, shortly after the death, some about 10 years after the death of Imam al-Ghazali. Now, when he appears, things are really bad. And they immediately begin to change. And um, Imad al-Din Zengi appears, and Shir Ku, uh, the uncle of Salah al-Din. Uh, Imad al-Din Zengi will be uh, assassinated. Um, he's assassinated by the assassins. So this is the age of the assassins. Uh, this is the age of the botany movement of the uh, Fatimids and the Ismailis and uh, the Karamita and others. And then Nur al-Din Zengi will uh, take charge. And of course he becomes one of the major generals of the jihad movement, and these people are the students of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. And then there is also there at that time the youthful Salah al-Din, who's just a teenager. And of course he will be one of the uh, officers of Nur al-Din Zengi, and then he will be the heir of that afterward. And he will establish the Ayyubids, who will of course invade Egypt, conquer Egypt. Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani told him he would conquer the Fatimids, and he told him also he had to. But there's no way to Jerusalem if you don't do that. You have to secure Egypt. And he told him he would fail the first time and succeed the second. So Salah al-Din then is one of the fruits of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. And all that jihad movement is one of the things that he puts together. 
Um, um, at this time now, the Sufi order is created. And the creator of that is Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. As we saw, before that time, um, tariqa is a technical term. And we've talked about what it means. It's just the methodology that you use on the spiritual path to move from sharia to haqiqa, or from haqiqa back to sharia. It's the middle, it's that middle link between those two. But now the word tariqa is going to take on another meaning, which is that of Sufi order, and that's because of the fact that Shaykh Abdul Qadir will make, that, make a particular methodology that he uses of the spiritual path common to a large group of people who will have allegiance to him. And here, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani introduces the bay'ah. Uh, we believe as Qadiris that he was given authorization to do that. And we believe as Qadiris that the bay'ah that Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani was given was, how would we say this, a shadow or a link to bay'at al-Ridwan, to the oath of God's pleasure that the companions, men and women, gave to the Prophet before the armistice of al Hudaybiyah, And of course that bay'ah then will be the bay'ah given to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and to Umar and to Uthman and to Ali and then to Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani's grandfather Al-Hassan, Imam Al-Hassan. He has that bay'ah. Of course, as you know, Imam Al-Hassan will give it up in order to save the lives of the Muslims and then the bay'ah will go to Muawiyah and the Muslims will be unified under Muawiyah, radiallahu anhum jami'an. In any case, uh, Shaykh Abdul Qadir now uses this bay'ah, and it is an oath of allegiance, except that it is not meant, and it will not be used politically. So he's not going to use it to claim the palace. He's not going to use it to order the police or to have his armies. But he will use it to organize his murids. So they become attached to him in a way that is a little bit different from the way that the sheikh and murid had been attached before that, before you have the order. Now this becomes a social movement. It becomes um, a cultural movement. It becomes a jihad movement in the case of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. Because the Qadiris, they will be a fundamental part of the army of Salah al-Din you know, and of that whole jihad movement. And this is very important. Um, it's said that the rise of the orders was in response to the Batani movements. This is what some scholars have said. Um, Probably there's truth in that, because the Batini movement was also like an order. In fact, you have the order of the assassins. And the Batini movement was extremely well organized, uh, based, of course, among the Fatimids in Azhar, in Cairo, and very difficult to compete with. So this is one of the reasons for the establishment of the order, that it can deal with the Batinis on their own terms and it can face them wherever they are. Again, the Sufi is the son of his time. So you have a big challenge in front of you, and what are you going to do about it? The political state's totally dysfunctional. It's not able to do that. And then the order is also in response to the decline of the caliphate. Because the caliph now is nothing but a name. At best, he's the mayor of Baghdad, and he's not even a good mayor. And you could even perhaps compare him to a, you know, mafioso. But the ummah doesn't benefit from him. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. So the decline of the caliphate, especially in the wake, in the face of the Crusades, and in the face of the Batini movements, 
Um, you know, this led to chaos everywhere and corruption everywhere and deterioration of the Ummah in its heartlands and on its frontiers. And here are the Crusaders and it cannot even respond. Okay, so um, the Sufi order then that Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani establishes, this will be its first task to bring the Ummah back together and to save it. And again, he's not interested in political power. That will be Nur al-Din. That will be Salah al-Din. And he will make dua for them or for other rulers in other regions. But, you know, prop them up, help them in this, and re-establish uh, this state. So they want, and then what the orders will strive to do is to create a social order around them using the murids and using the futuwa, these chivalrous organizations that they have to try to establish a social order based on ihsan. It's amazing that, um, you know, we are in uh, quite similar situations today, aren't we? Um, we also are in a desperate situation and we over and over again are unable to use the kind of institutions that have been established to do the things they're supposed to do, to defend the Ummah and to protect it, to bring it together, to give it life. So the creation of the order then, it comes out of that. And uh, here, one of the things that we notice is the fact that the idea that the Sufis were pacifists and that they didn't do jihad, that has absolutely zero historical merit. They are mujahidun. And in fact, the word murabit, which is the person who goes to the ribat to wait, to guard the frontiers and to protect the ummah, uh, that word in North Africa becomes synonymous with Sufi, doesn't it? Okay, so they are people of jihad. And we mentioned uh, in the first lesson, you know, the uh, story of Muhammad ibn Wasi' uh, who fought under Qutayba ibn Muslim, and he belonged to the first century of Islam. He died at the end of the first century. Uh, as you remember, uh, he's one of the first people to be called Sufi. And that's because he wore wool. But um, he fought under Qutayba ibn Muslim in the conquest of Central Asia. He was a judge also, so he's very knowledgeable of the law. But Qutayba said of him, the finger of Muhammad ibn Wasi' pointing upwards towards heaven in battle is more dear to me than 100,000 renowned swords in the hands of 100,000 uh, strong young men, uh, you know, fitya. So uh, the Sufis always had this relationship with jihad, and they were always regarded to be, as in the case of Muhammad ibn Wasi', the key to victory, the key to success, the key to peace, bi idnillahi ta'ala. We see that throughout Islamic history. Uh, now the Sufi orders, they will often be involved in jihad. And Shaykh Abdul Qadir's is a good example of that. And um, we can give other examples. Uh, the great Qadri Shaykh of West Africa, Uthman Danfodio. So Uthman Danfodio lives in the 18th century, dies in the 19th. He is a Qadri, a very, uh, in, in a very sincere follower of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. But his jihad movement does wonders in West Africa. And, you know, it's also one of the things that's able to keep the colonial powers out for a relatively long time. In the end, it won't be able to do that, but it's also able to lay down the foundations of what will become modern Nigeria. And we have also the Senussi movement of Muhammad ibn Ali as Senussi, who um, belongs roughly to the same time, although he's a little bit later than Sheikh Othman Danfodio. And the Senussi movement will not only be strong in Libya, but in Central Africa, 
in East Africa, in various parts of North Africa, even into Chad, even into the areas where Othman Danfodio is. So we just want to make that point that um, one of the fallacies which is often spread about the Sufis is that they were pacifists. That's not true. Uh, these are people who um, were very much involved in the jihad movements and in the armies of the Muslim world. So, Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani then, um, he establishes his order. His order then is the first in Islamic history. And we believe that all other orders are connected to him. Uh, that's very clear in the case of most of them. In some it might not be quite so uh, clear, at least not to me, given my ignorance. But immediately out of the order of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani will come two other orders. One is the Kesna Zaniya, the Kesna Zaniya, from al Kesna Zani. al Kesna Zani was a Kurd, and he was... Um, one of the students of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. It may be that his order is the first to come out of the Qadiri path. I don't know for sure, but his is very important. Uh, it's to this day very strong among the Kurds. They often call it the Kesna Zaniya Qadiriya. And then also you have the Suhra Wardi, uh, the Suhra Wardi path, which goes back to Abu Najib Abdul Qadir, Abdul Qahir as Suhra Wardi, uh, there are three Sohawardis. Uh, this is the first of them, to, of the famous ones to appear. And uh, he is the author of the book called Adab al-Muridin. Adab al-Muridin, which is one of the great sources for Adab al-Murid, the, the Adab of the Murid. Um, as Sohrawardi is a contemporary of Ab Abdul Qadir, uh, so is al kasnazani and so his tariqah also comes from that same time. It also was called at tariqa as suhra wardiya al qadiriya or al qadiriya as suhra wardiya. Um, now, also at this time, as a contemporary of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, uh, you have Ahmed al Rifai, and the Rifai's uh, appear as a result of this. This is also the time of Abu Medin al Ghoth. Abu Medin al Ghoth is in Algeria and uh, he will take bay'ah from Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. And uh, then um, he transmits to a number of people. But among those that he transmits to is al-Faqih al-Muqaddam, who is Muhammad ibn Ali ba'alawi. And this, uh, he's of that same time, the 7th century, the 13th century. And so the ba'alawi tariqah, uh, it also comes out of that same it's, it's that same rough period. It's a little bit later, also connected to Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. Uh, the Sheikh of Abdul Salam ibn Mashish is Abu Medin al Ghoth. So he takes from him, taking from Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, and from him, of course, the great Imam Abu Hassan al Shadili and the Shadili Tariqah. And then we have Mu'in al Din Shishti. Um, he and Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani are actually very close in their lineages, and he also will take from that same line, um, I believe from one of the sons of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. Um, this is also roughly the period of Ibn Arabi, Muhyiddin. Ibn Arabi, uh, Ibn Arabi called himself uh, one of the Karamat of Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani. And he said that because his mother and father had been childless and they had grown very old and had no hopes of having a child. And his father went to Baghdad and he met Sheikh uh, Abdul Qadir al Jilani and he made a dua for him to have a son. And he went back home and his wife conceived and they had Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. So he called himself, he said, I'm nothing but one of the Karamat of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani. And Muhyiddin ibn Arabi will take the bay'ah from Abdul Razak, uh, the son of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani. This is also roughly the time of Jalal al Din Rumi, and you know he is also uh, he's also linked with Sheikh Abdul Qadir uh, as well. 
In any case, um, these orders then appear and um, they begin, you know, to um, have a powerful effect on the Islamic Ummah. And they are um, institutions that grow up in the absence of political power. That's really where they come from, and they're fundamentally linked to that. That this is the Sunni response. That the caliphate's not doing what it's supposed to do. So this becomes like a type of spiritual caliphate. And then it will do the work, it will do the job, but it won't seek political power. The orders will tend to work very well with political power when it is there. They'll do that in India or in Central Asia or under the Ottoman Turks or wherever, wherever it may be. And there are certain generalizations that we can say about them. Uh, first of all, that they are the great spreaders of Islam. We can say that about the Sufis in general, because um, this is one of the gifts they had. They are the great propagators of this faith. And when the order is formed, you know, then uh, you know, this will be uh, even more true. So the orders play a fundamental role in taking Islam to different parts of Central Asia, uh, to the uh, Nusantara, to the archipelago of Indonesia and Malaysia and the Philippines, to <coughs> Cambodia, to Thailand, um, you know, to Africa, to Europe, and, and elsewhere. And they're extremely gifted at this and extremely good. Again, the Sufis were always doing that. And when we read the history of the Sufis, you'll see that um, they bring many people into Islam. And that's true in that early period when they didn't have an order. But the greatness of the saint often is um, the catalyst that will bring people back to the religion and renew the faith, but also bring in Jews and Christians. And we have many stories like that. Ma'ruf al-Karhi, who belongs to the second century, um, you know, they say that a monk might come to visit him and just see him appear in the door of his mosque and take the shahada just from seeing him. So these people had amazing gifts for da'wah and that's one of the best things that they did. They are the people of da'wah. They are also uh, the people of universalism. Uh, what do we mean by that? Uh, in the fact that they make Islam meaningful to all the people on earth, wherever that might be. Uh, the Chinese Sufis, for example, will present Islam in an authentic, genuine way. They don't betray the message, but they portray it in such a way that it makes all the sense in the world to the Buddhist, to the Confucianist, and to the Taoist of China. And in China, the Chinese Muslim sages did this actually for the sake of the Muslims themselves. Because Islam is very old in China. And <clears throat> Islam was very well established in China. Islam was a state religion of China. And many of the Muslims served as generals, soldiers and officers of the emperor. Okay. And they also served uh, as treasurers and different uh, administrators of the state. But because they did this, they received Chinese education. They were masters of the Chinese language. They studied the classics of the Chinese sages and historians, and that meant that although they regarded Arabic to be a sacred language, and in fact they regarded Persian too to be a sacred language, to this day the Chinese Muslims regard Persian to be a sacred language second only to Arabic. But to understand Islam from Persian and Arabic was not necessarily easy for them. Not because the languages are different, because they learn the languages. 
but because the world views of those languages are so different from the cognitive frames of Chinese and the Chinese language. And so therefore, the great sages of China want to explain Islam to the Chinese Muslims in Chinese terms. And they do that brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly. But in doing that, they also create a rich literature that makes all the sense in the world to the Buddhist, to the Confucianist, and to the Taoist. And so many of those come into Islam because of that work. But this is part of that universalism. It is part of the ability to bring out the universalism that is inherent in Islam and to make it make sense to people and to show that this religion doesn't belong to a particular ethnic group and it doesn't belong to a particular culture and it doesn't belong to a particular geographical region that it is for all human beings so they're very very good at that also they are great globalists Islam will create uh, one of the first global civilizations uh, that the world ever saw vast global civilization um, Ibn uh, Marco Polo will leave the city of Venice and he will travel to the east to see um, the greatness of China and the Muslim world okay when he comes home in the 14th century to Venice another traveler leaves his home in Morocco and that's Ibn Battuta Ibn Battuta will travel three times as far as Marco Polo but Marco Polo will be in foreign territory from the time that he gets just a few miles from Venice Ibn Battuta will never be he will travel three times as far he will go throughout China he will go to the Maldive Islands he will go throughout India he will go to um, the Nusantara archipelago he will go to Africa and to East Africa he will go to Spain and Portugal but never is he in a foreign country because everywhere he goes there are Muslims and he lives with them and he can speak to them in Arabic some of them know it they're educated people and uh, he's received by them as well so Islam was remarkably global but in putting together that global Islam trade is one of the most important factors world trade the silk route and then also the sea route that went by the Indian Ocean to the China Sea through the Straits of Malacca and through the Straits of Jakarta all of these Muslim territory okay so trade is a big part of that a huge part of that but also uh, the Sufis and also the scholars as well but these are itinerant Sufis who also belong to orders and they travel through this world when we read Ibn Battuta he tells us about these brotherhoods and he tells us about the orders and how they take him in, take him in, and how they feed him, and take and, and you know take care of him, and so forth. So um, this is one of their aspects. And the Sufis were the great creators of culture and civilization. China, the example that I just gave you, uh, we could talk about that forever, and give you example after example. The brilliance of Chinese Islam is second to nothing they created an incredible civilization it is authentically Islamic it is almost a hundred percent Hanafi they are Hanafis and it is Qadiri, Naqshbandi uh, they have some other paths as well but it is also thoroughly Chinese beautifully Chinese which enables Islam to become rooted in China and at the same time it becomes an invitation to the Chinese to come into the faith and to adopt it without adopting a foreign faith uh, in fact and with the Chinese the fact that something is Chinese 
and is not foreign is very, very important. And the Chinese Muslims will even give Islam a Chinese name so that they can call it that. They will call it also Islam, which they pronounce Yisilan, which if you write it in Chinese, you have to use certain um, symbols and you get uh, something like fragrant female orchid, which is not bad, you know, that Islam <laughs> is fragrant female orchid. But you pronounce it Yisilan, Yisilan. Uh, but then, just to have, you know, their own symbols for it, they called it Qing Jin Jiao, which meant the religion of the pure and the real. And that means something to you. It rings a bell. Wouldn't you be interested in knowing what my religion is? It's the religion of the real and the pure. Wouldn't you like to know? But the Chinese really want to know, because those words... Uh, trigger off in their minds incredible responses that then this must be the way of Confucius this must be the way of Lao Tzu this must be the way of the Yellow Emperor and the Muslims understood that and they also said that they said that when Islam came to China the truths of the Yellow Emperor who may have been a prophet he lived thousands of years ago they were not all gone Many of them were still there, and Islam came to bring them back to life. So Muslims are the great cultural creators, masters of language, masters of poetry. They speak to people in their own languages. They master those languages. They know the people. They know the people. They know where they're strong. They know where they're weak. They know how those people worship if they're non-Muslims, and they know the amazing aspects of their worship and the things that are not so amazing. So they know how to approach them in that. And here, um, I want to just give you a good example. We have here our beautiful brothers and sisters from Nusantara, from Malaysia and the archipelago. And this is the story of a great Qadri Sheikh, Ismail, uh, who is called Sultan al-Arifin. And he's the one who's buried in Peso Besar in the Straits of Malacca. This was uh, one of the descendants of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, and um, you know, he is uh, the, sh the Sheikh of uh, Sunan Giri and of Sunan Bonang. So they spent a lot of time with him. And this great man, this is in the, uh, four, in the 15th and 16th century, in the 1400s and the 1500s, just before the Portuguese come, the Portuguese are going to attack. And so he will be there. They say that Sidi Ismail was sent uh, to uh, that part of the world from Mecca by a dream from his prophet, our prophet, his great-grandfather. And so he went there. And he'll stay there and he'll work very hard. And uh, so uh, in conjunction with him, and we don't want to say from him, that would be an exaggeration, but you get what are called wali songo. These are the nine saints of Java. Sunan Gresik, Sunan Ampel, Sunan Giri, Sunan Kalijaga, who's one of the greatest of them, Sunan Bonang, uh, Sunan Drajat, Sunan Kudus, Sunan Muria, Sunan Gunungjati. So these are the nine saints, and these people are an excellent example, one of the best examples of all, not only of spreading Islam, but of doing it with the greatest subtlety, the greatest sophistication, the greatest beauty, philosophical profundity. So they are able actually to bring the island of Java to consolidate Islam in the island of Java, which is one of the uh, great islands of Nusantara. And they're able to do this, again, by respecting the people, by loving the people, knowing the people. They use the Javanese language with a, a precision and with a subtleness that is uh, unmatched. Uh, at that time, you have in Java um, a great civilization which is uh, Hindu-Buddhist. Most of the people are Hindus, and they are Shivite Hindus. And then you have also a particular type of Buddhism, which, if I'm not mistaken, is unique to Java. 
but it's also very strong. So they understand this Buddhism extremely well, and they understand this Shivite Hinduism very well, and they know how to speak to its followers and how to call them to Islam without offending them <clears throat> and without um, angering them, but by showing them certain similarities between what they already believe and what they already practice and what's there in Islam. And one of the themes of the nine saints, the Wali Songo, is that nothing beats the Qur'an. They were all masters of the Qur'an. And this is almost one of the requirements of the path. You have to know it by heart. You have to recite it by heart. But they're always showing how, first of all, the recitation of the Qur'an is so beautiful. It's so musical. And that given the beauty, that despite the beauty that is there in the Shivite tradition or the Buddhist tradition in their different recitations and chants, you can't really match the Qur'an. So they always bring the Qur'an to the people. They, and, and they make the recitation of the Qur'an something that is extremely attractive and they teach them that. And then uh, at the same time they show them that the teaching of this book is remarkable and it answers all the questions that we have. So they're able to put together an amazing culture and the question of you know how Islam comes to that part of the world is of course a big question and uh, there's, no que there's no doubt about the fact that the Arabs and the Persians and others they played a great role, they were traders, they were teachers, they were scholars, but um, Another powerful influence here that you see very clearly also in the Nine Saints is Chinese Islam. So you have Chinese Islam with all of its cultural brilliance. It is actually um, pollinating in that area and bringing about this great uh, development. One of the amazing things that they will do, for example, which is associated with um, you know, Sunan Kalijaga and I think Sunan Muria, probably is the main one. I'd have to check that and you might, you probably would know, I don't remember. Um, but they will use puppets as primary dais. So they spread Islam through puppets and they create these incredible shadow puppets, the Javanese shadow puppet, and they train the puppeteers Puppeteers already know how to use puppets, but they train them how to do it our way. And they have beautiful music uh, with gamelan orchestras. It's a different type of music. Uh, if you've never heard it before, you might have to hear it more than once before you appreciate its beauty, but it's very beautiful. They have incredibly beautiful gamelan music. They have also songs and poetry in Javanese. And then they have the puppet shows. And the puppet shows are really beautiful. And the puppet shows will tell you about Islam. They will tell you about ethics and morality. They also give da'wah uh, to the Hindus and the Buddhists. So you have puppet stories about the prophet Joseph and his encounter with Shiva. Or you have Hamza, the uncle of the prophet, in his encounter with um, uh, you know, maybe uh, some other Hindu figure or Hindu god. So they make up stories, but you know, but this way they're able to show the greatness of Islam. They're able to articulate it in terms that are meaningful to the people. They teach them everything they need to know, to, to know through the puppet shows, which are also done at night. And uh, these are mostly rice peasants who are working in the rice paddies. And so now they come to enjoy the puppet show. They learn about Islam. They learn about ethics. They learn about adab. They learn about morality. It's absolutely brilliant. And um, you know, so and this is also a function of the orders. It's a function of Sufism per se, but also the working of the orders. Uh, we could give other examples of that, and among those would be uh, the way the Sufis worked in India, for example. Uh, to create there a culture of da'wah. Thank you very much. 
uh, to create a culture of da'wah, you know, that um, makes it possible for a Hindu to embrace Islam without becoming casteless, outcast. Uh, the Hindu society of India, and what is today India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, it was a caste society. And your caste meant everything. And to have no caste meant to die. And to be an outcast was maybe worse than death. How do you spread Islam then in that society? If the man embraces Islam, he'll be cast out of his caste. That is a fate worse than death. And if the woman embraces Islam, what do you do? So they create a whole culture in which they learn, in which they're able to do this um, in a very subtle way and in a very careful way, and also in which they're able to receive the outcast if that happens. One of the things they will do, for example, is create these langars, which are huge soup food kitchens. And um, if you go to Pakistan or India and you find these, you should really visit them. They're amazing. But they're huge kitchens. Um, the ones I've been in are bigger than this whole audience sitting here. Uh, you know, an area bigger than that. And they give you breakfast, they give you lunch, and they give you dinner every day of the week. And it's good, too. I mean, uh, when we went to visit one of these langars, our host, who was very happy we were coming and he wanted to honor us, he took us to the langar to eat. So it's not food that you're going to get sick from. It was very good food. And again, the, the food is there for anyone who wants to eat it. They don't ask, are you Muslim, are you Hindu, are you Sunni, are you Shia? They don't even ask, are you hungry? Just sit down and eat, right? So this is a way that they're able to take in the Hindus who are outcast or the poor who have no means. And then they have other techniques like that. And um, I won't go into that in greater detail because we're out of time. But... Um, you know, um, let's say just a few words about the Sufis and Ahlul Bayt. We have about ten minutes, right? <clears throat> okay, so, excuse me as I get this in order. So let's, let's end with this today, Sufism and Ahlul Bayt. <clears throat> this question is a question that um, has really been brought up by Orientalists, I believe, more than anyone else. A lot of Muslims, they read their books and believe them. And they get from the Orientalists the idea that the Sufi is a pacifist and he doesn't take part in jihad. That fallacy comes mostly out of the Orientalists who simply didn't do their homework. And then also the issue of Sufism and, and Shiism. <coughs> and uh, so what is the relationship between the two? And I'll just say a few words about that. And I want to be careful. Um, not to offend anyone in saying that. The, first of all, um, Sufism as a historical phenomenon is overwhelmingly a Sunni phenomenon. It's not 100%. Uh, the Shia also will be part of it. Uh, we talked about the Kaz, uh, Kazmania path, the Kazmania Qadiriya who were one of the first orders to branch off from the circle of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani. So they're not Shi'i, they are Kurdish and Sunni, but they, also, they always welcome the Shia, and they always take in a lot of Shia. And a lot of the Shia look upon that tariqah as one of their own. So the Shia also have their role in the history of Sufism, especially when we talk about 
the metaphysical Sufism, which I'd like to talk about in the next class, um, their, the, their role is also uh, very important. Uh, again, it's going to be a lesser role in some ways than that of you know, the Sunnis. But Sufism tends to be a uh, Sunni phenomenon. Okay, that's, it tends to be. And, you know, we have something in common with the Shia, and that's the love of Ahlul Bayt. But probably no one here would have to be convinced that the love of Ahlul Bayt is part of the Sunnah. And if Sunnis don't love Ahlul Bayt, then they're not true to their own tradition. And so for the, the Sufis, they have that too. It's one of those things that's just really part of the general Sunni legacy, the general Islamic legacy, the love of the Prophet and then the love of his family. Um, now, what is the role of Ahlul Bayt in the history of Sufism? And um, the role of Ahlul Bayt is uh, quite conspicuous. We mentioned, for example, uh, Muhammad al-Baqir, Ja'far al-Sadiq, they're very conspicuous in the, the path. Of course, today we're talking about Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. Uh, many of the great Shaykhs are Ahlul Bayt. So they do have a conspicuous place. And um, yet, if we were to take the list of the people that we mentioned in the beginning, in the first 550 years, and in the time after that, uh, the majority of them are not Ahlul Bayt. So you have all sorts of different backgrounds. So um, the Sufis, when they talk about Wilaya, sometimes they will say that Wilaya in its highest form <coughs> has in it three elements. It has in it the element of Kesb, of what you earn, the things that you do, learning, mastering the knowledge of Islam, doing the fard, doing the nawafil, praying and fasting, uh, good that you do, charity that you give and so forth. So you have action and you have to have good actions. You do good, you work and you work and you work. So that's part of it. And then they say also, uh, Nesib. But, so here, if your Nesib is Ahlul Bayt, if your family is Ahlul Bayt, then is there a better family on the face of the earth? You have a very good Nesib. But you might also be of so many other genealogies and so many other lineages and from different people from Turks and from Persians and from Chinese or whatever. But so here what they mean is that usually wilaya, um, your family is an important part of that. Meaning your mothers, your fathers, your ancestors. And often the wilaya that's given to you is a crown that's put on their heads. So family background is important. And that doesn't mean that a person could come from a background where they had no background that they knew at all and not achieve anything okay but they say that's one of the elements and then they say the third element is the gift of God that God bestows upon uh, his wali um, you know the gift of his knowledge and his closeness and brings him to him um, let's suffice with that tonight and inshallah, we will try now to begin to take questions. So inshallah, we'll meet tomorrow for the last time, the fifth class. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about what I've called giving reality a voice in the world. So we'll try to talk about uh, the intellectual legacy of the Sufis, bi ta'ala. <coughs> Is
So these are some of the questions that we've taken from you. You hand in the questions and then uh, our wonderful brother Hisham and his wife, they go through them and uh, they then give them to me. Makes it easier for me. Can someone move from one tariqah to another? Um, yes, you can. And in some cases, you have to. What you don't want to do is to shop around. You want to find the path and hold to it. If it turns out that the Shaykh is not what he's supposed to be, then you have to leave. That would be the general rule. There might be conditions we talked about yesterday where a person might stay on. But that would be an exception to the rule. If the sheikh is toxic, that toxicity is likely to affect you. So you should move on, bi'ithni lahi ta'ala. And it may, may be that you have one tariqah and then you find another that is truer to you. So you can move on to it. I've heard sheikh say that a real sheikh may take a murid and in reality the murid is not his. The murid belongs to someone else. But he holds the murid until that other sheikh comes. And so when that sheikh comes then the, then the murid goes to him. He goes to another path. So you don't have to hold to one path. But again, uh, you don't want to leave a path without a valid reason. What are the differences between the Sufi paths? Um, I think that we answered that tonight. That tariqah originally means methodology. It means the approach that is taken to bridge sharia ah with haqiqah. And to get us from sharia to haqiqah and from haqiqah to sharia. Ah. And as we heard tonight, that in the first 550 years of Islam, tariqah is a concept and it is a technique. After the time of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, it will continue to be that, except that that technique now will become general for a large group of people who um, ha are bound to the Sheikh by a particular type of commitment. In the case of his order, it was the bay'ah. Not all of the paths have bay'ah, by the way. But you, they will take that particular methodology as something that holds them together and governs them as a group. One of the things also about the tariqah that is very important that we didn't talk about today is the fact that the tariqah, given its social and cultural nature, uh, can take in all kinds of people who ordinarily wouldn't be able to be the disciples of teachers. And that's because it can take in the common people, it can take in the peasants, it can take in all sorts of people. And that's in fact what it will do. This is one of the things that makes it so attractive to the people and also serves the people as well. And they will serve the path and they will take great joy in it, and they will be positively, positively affected by it. Muslims, wherever Islam is well, are known for their tremendous generosity and their tremendous courtesy. And this is something that comes from Islam, of course, but this is something also that spread throughout the Ummah under the aegis of the Sufi orders. Because one of the things they teach the people is adab, how to receive guests, how to treat guests, and this is a fine art with them. In a lot of the Sufi orders, even to this day, if you were to go to visit them, they won't ask you who you are, and they won't ask you why you came. They will give you food, and then they will give you the means to wash up or to take a shower or to sleep or to relax. And then after that, you're rested and you're clean and you've eaten. 
then they'll ask you, and who are you? And uh, where did you come from? And what do you want to do? See, so this is all part of the art of perfect adab, the art of perfect generosity. And, of course, this is something that affects the common people and benefits the common people, and then they begin to take it on themselves. And the Sufis also have adab about tolerance and toleration. I mentioned to you uh, a Sufi sheikh that I had for 19 years who was extremely correct, extremely knowledgeable, uh, amazing man, and yet um, I might go, he, we might hear a knock on the door, and I go out into his little garden and open the door, and there is a guest coming to visit him who doesn't, who appears like he probably hasn't prayed for all of his life. Uh, he smells like cigarettes. Um, if you asked him to recite Al Fatiha, uh, you know, you wouldn't be surprised if he couldn't do it. And uh, he's a Muslim, and he comes from the same ethnic background as the Sheikh, which was Eritrean. And we bring him in, and he's treated like he's the Prince of Persia, or as if he were the greatest wali on the face of the earth. And not a word is said to offend him. And not a word is said to correct him directly. He's not ready for that. So he will be received with the greatest of honor and the greatest of joy with the hope that he'll come back and come back again and again. So this is the way they are. They are a mercy as the blessed Prophet ﷺ was a mercy. And um, so this is also something that spread among the people. And one of the great, un great misfortunes of the Muslim world today is that because we have, so many of us, turned our back on that legacy and in many cases rejected it totally, we become sometimes really impolite people, really arrogant people. And this should have never been the case. But if you reject these people, then you also reflect the whole science of courtesy and service and love and are you likely to get it from some other source after that? How to warn people about a false sheikh without destroying his reputation? Don't worry about his reputation. Uh, you know, the facet is halal. Um, you don't want to be a fitna, and you don't want to uh, make things worse than they are and you have to be careful also because maybe your judgment is not correct <clears throat> but <clears throat> um, warning people about a false sheikh is something that is important to do and it's good to do that in a wise and judicious manner and we warn people about hypocrites in general and we don't go around denouncing people unless there's a need to do that. But if you knew, for example, that a person wanted to go into a business agreement with a person who's notorious for stealing people's money, you don't have any obligation to warn them? Would it be backbiting to do that? No. So, um, it's important to do that. And it's important to give the general warning. And that's why when we talk about Sufism, we shouldn't be talking about never, never land. You know, because, again, it was a reality, Sufism, that had no name. Then it became a name that had no reality. And the people who have that reality, to this day, don't call themselves Sufis, because that's a big claim. They don't like to make it. There are people who love the Sufis and they might call themselves mutasawwif in the sense that they imitate the Sufis. But a lot of the people who really harm the Ummah and who harm other people and entire families, you know, they will take that name 
and use it as a means to do that. So we have to give that warning and repeat that warning. And in some cases, we have to warn people, this man is not a sheikh. Stay away from him. Don't take his hand. Um, I've had to do that on certain occasions. And I hated to do it, to tell you the actual truth. I hated to do it. But a very important person was asking me about a person that I know of quite well. And I just said, beware of him. And then one of the people in my audience, this is a private audience, by the way, he said, that's not enough. You have to tell him what you know. You have to tell him the whole story. I didn't want to do that, but so I did. I told him everything I knew about the person. And uh, that was important because this person would have been hurt greatly by following him, and he would have brought harm to many other people as well. <clears throat> you mentioned a person who died because his false sheikh gave him the wrong adhkar. How can dhikr kill you? Um, well, first of all, uh, I should have never made a statement like that. What I said is that I thought that this person, who he, he took the hand of this false sheikh, and this false sheikh, we know him to be outrageous. You can't trust him with money. You can't trust him with women. You can't trust him with anything. He knows nothing about adhkar. He pulls them out of the books. He makes them up himself, and our blessed friend took the path, and then he dies. He died in Salat al after Salat al-Fajr, sitting in his own mosque, uh, doing dhikr. And he was, mashallah, in the position of, uh, you know, sitting when he died. And may God accept from him, and may God make him a martyr. Um, the thing is, is that adhkar are very powerful and you have to know what they do and you have to know the effect that they will have on you so you don't play with them and you don't make them up I know of a young man who is having great difficulty becoming sane and he drove himself insane by making up his own dhikrs from the name of God, names of God. So he would take any of the names of God and then just make up his own dhikr of it. Ya Dar, Ya Dar, Ya Dar, God protect us. Ya Qabil, Ya Mudil. Okay, we don't do that. I just did it. Pray for me. <laughs> right? But that's what he did, experimented. And he became psychologically deranged and haunted he destroyed himself and when he when I came to know of him you know then the first thing you have is regret that why did you do this and this is also a reason why you don't just pick up a book of adhkar Sufi adhkar that you buy in the bookstore and take it home and start reading it uh, you may go crazy and the adhkar may be perfectly good but you don't have idhan for them and not only that you haven't been prepared for them and that's why we said that often a shaykh will begin you with very few things to do as dhikr very few okay and this is because it's medicine it's medicine to get you <coughs> right and to cure you, and then he may add on, and he may add on. Um, I had a path before the path I have now for 19 years. Uh, the sheikh was the one I mentioned to you before. It was a beautiful path. I'm not going to mention its name, but it was a beautiful path. The adhkar were extremely beautiful. I loved them, but we had in that path a number of big dhikrs and uh, they were in the front of the book my sheikh gave me the book when I first came to him in 1984 and he said don't ever look at the ones in the front of the book you're not allowed to do that I carry the book with me everywhere I went 
And for 13 years, I never looked at them, because he said not to. He said, don't even skim read them. After 13 years, he gave me the permission to begin to recite them. Okay? So, dhikr is powerful. Dhikr is transformative. You want it to be a positive, healthy transformation. And it can do other things as well. If we take a dhikr that we're not given, and, we, and we're not ready to recite it, it can make us go into a state of spiritual insanity. A state when we're not really insane, but we're not sane, we're not like other people. And um, we can't get ourselves out of that state either. It would take a great sheikh to be able to do that. So you don't play with adhkar. And um, if you take any of the adhkar of the Blessed Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or take them from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, you're safe. Because they have general idhan. But the, the other adhkar, they're for special people and special situations. They're not for everybody. Another thing, too, is that um, my first sheikh, this, this first primary sheikh, he used to say that one of the reasons why we're in the mess we're in now is because people, Sufis, go to the bookstores and buy the adhkar of other paths, or even they use the adhkar of their own path, and they use them to destroy their enemies or to destroy other paths. Is that, can you believe that? But they do that. And, of course, that, they will be the first to be destroyed. That's what will happen, but that's total ignorance. And one of the things that we were taught is you never make dua against anyone. And even if the person is a monster, you just, we were taught, just say, Allahumma amilhu bima yastahiq. God, deal with him as he deserves. But don't curse him. And don't use your ad'iyah against him. Again, the Sufis are the people of trusts. And one of those trusts is that they do not misuse the secrets they've been given. And they do not misuse the dhikrs that they've been given. Um, we have stories... I presume they're true, because I've heard them from really truthful people. Even if they're not true, they're good stories. And these are stories about um, people who are given the greatest name of God. Ismullah al-A'zam. The one that if you use it, then you get whatever you ask for. They say in one of these stories that a person on the path wanted to know where he could get the greatest name of God. And so his sheikh said, well, there is a man who has it in such and such a village. And so you can go and see him. And so he went to see the man. And, and then when he saw the man, he said the man was weak and poor and wretched and old. And he was riding on a donkey and I think he was collecting wood and uh, people were mocking him, and they were throwing rocks at him, and, um, and the, the person left, and he came back, and he said, I, I saw the man, but he said, like, he's got the greatest name of God. I mean, he's one of the most miserable people I've ever met in my life. And then the sheikh said, and what would you have done? He said, wallahi, I would have burned the earth under their feet. Like, if they'd thrown rocks at you and they had treated you this way. He said, I would have burned the earth under their feet. He said, that's why you'll never be given the greatest name of God. Because these people will never use it for themselves. And that's why they're given other trusts as well. Because they will not misuse those trusts. And that's why it's so important for us also, when we're given different adhkar and different du'as, you know, don't misuse it. Don't abuse it. Use it for God. As we said, if you go on the path, you go on the path to get close to God. So don't have any other motive. 
Let that be your motive always. Um, so, is it permissible to, be to begin a path and with time, along with experience, uh, you get total trust and submission? Or <coughs> do submission and trust have to be 100% from the first day, from day one? That's a good question. That's a very good question. And uh, the answer, according to what I know, is no. You can come in. And, in fact, um, in many cases, the murid or the murida who comes into the path are going to have lingering doubts. Because, first of all, um, you don't really know the sheikh. You trust him. And you've heard good things about him, maybe. And maybe you look at him and say, he looks so trustworthy. And you're around him and you like the aura that he has. But, you know, you need to know him because he is your father. And, you know, you need to know really who he is. So this is one of the reasons why as you take the path and you follow the path, one of the most beautiful things that happens is that every year you come to know your sheikh much better than before. Uh, to the extent that you may be ashamed of the way you were with him a year or two ago. And again, they have khususiya, they have bashariya, they have their humanness, which makes them just like you and me. But they have a khususiya, which is hidden. And sometimes that khususiya comes out, especially when you have the gift of company. And when it comes out, it can be frightening. That like, my God, who is he? You know, and like you ask him a question, and he answers it. And you ask him another question, he answers it. And like, it, he never talked about things like that. So that's one of the beautiful things in companionship. You come to know your companion. And the same thing's true of the murids and the muridas. That as we go down the path with each other, we come to know each other. And um, I don't see any of them here tonight, but, you know, I have a group um, of Egyptians with me and with us whom I met in Chicago how many years ago? I'd have to calculate. You know, m more than um, 10 years ago. And uh, they were so beautiful from the very beginning. And they'd come and see me, and we had dhikr sessions, and I was teaching the hikam. And they wanted, like anything, you know, to be, to follow me and so forth. And, you know, like, you accept that, but it's as the years go by, you discover who they are. And every one of them is a hundred times greater than I ever imagined in the beginning. It makes me ashamed of how little I perceived in the beginning. And this is one of the beauties of companionship, isn't it? Like maybe your companion is solid gold, but you wouldn't know that if you didn't keep his company. And the same thing's true of the muridas. You find out that they have incredible qualities that you never knew before. So there's great benefit in that, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. There is a story, also when you come to the shaykh, do you come to him perfect? or imperfect. Um, sometimes people come perfect. Uh, Jalal ad-Din Rumi comes to Shams Tabrizi about as perfect as you can be. Shams will make him even more and even more. And he will make Shams even more because they have, they're like sheikhs of each other, although Shams is the big sheikh, really, and the great sheikh. But most of us come to our sheikhs very imperfect. In fact, sometimes we come to a sheikh with a big problem that we cannot solve. And maybe the fact that he solved it, that's what makes you attached to him. So there is a story, again, let's say it's true. Even if it's not, it's a good story. And this is of a murid who took the hand of a sheikh. 
And his sheikh was a true sheikh. And so he went home and he dreamed. And he saw his sheikh. And he saw his sheikh in the form of a pig. And he came to the sheikh the next day, next day and he said, Sidi, I saw you last night in the form of a pig. He said, that's okay. And then he went and he dreamt again. He saw him in the form of a dog. He said, Sidi, I saw you in the form of a dog. He said, that's all right. And then he went back and he dreamt again. And he saw him in the form of an ape. And so he told him that. And he got the same answer. And then he saw the sheikh in his radiance beauty. And he came, he said, last night I saw you as you truly are. And he said, alhamdulillah. He said, before you were just seeing yourself. <laughs> so, um, I think you brought this up, Sheikh, in the class. Who was the wali in Morocco who traumatized the Spanish king in the 17th century? Now that wasn't this year. Whoever wrote that, God bless them, they were at another lesson. Um, is it, there anyone here from Algiers? I think it's Sheikh al Hawari, but I don't know for sure. But I think it's Sheikh al Hawari. It's one of the great sheikhs of Algiers. And um, what happened was that, of course, you had the Spanish Armada. The Spanish Armada was a huge fleet. And Spain at that time is the biggest empire in the world and the wealthiest. This is the, the 16th and 17th century. Spain was the biggest and most powerful. Spain controlled all of America, North, Middle, and South, and the Caribbean. All of that was Spanish. And they got gold and silver from it and other things. The Philippines were Spanish. Uh, much of Italy was Spanish. Uh, Holland was Spanish. Brutal war. And Spain and Portugal were all Spanish. There was no Portugal. It was United Kingdom of Spain and Portugal. Spain was very powerful. Um, since this is history, what was the most powerful country on earth at that time? It wasn't Spain. Number one was, what? The Ottomans. The Ottomans, mashallah. They were number one. And the Ottomans were organized. And they were efficient. And I love them. I don't have to even tell you that. I can't conceal it. And uh, second most powerful were the Mughals of India. And third were the Safavids of Iran. And fourth were the Shaibanids of Bukhara and Central Asia. All of these are much more powerful and effective than the Spanish, and a hundred times more efficient. Spanish Muslims were very efficient. Hard to believe that today, isn't it? Today it's like we can mess it up if nobody else can't. You know? But in those days we were very efficient. And, but the Spanish were powerful, and especially in Europe, they're very dangerous. The Spanish sent an armada to England to conquer it, and God destroyed that armada. That's a very important chapter in history. That's about 1588. I believe after that, possibly in the early 1600s, and again, I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. Uh, the king of Spain sent an armada to attack Algeria. And they were outside of Algiers. They covered the whole horizon. And I was told this by a Sufi that I believe in, uh, and I believe him to be truthful. He said that the sheikh, I think his name was Hawari, he went to the sea and he threw pebbles in it. And I think he said, Shahat al Wujuh. Shahat al Wujuh. And then they say the clouds gathered, a storm uh, came up, and the ships were destroyed by each other. They ran into each other, because there are lots of them, they're close together. And they say that's when the Spanish king, I think it's King Charles, he just left. And he went to a monastery, 
uh, which is well known in Extremadura in Spain, and he lived the rest of his life in the monastery. Uh, did he become a Muslim? I don't know. Uh, how are we doing with time? Five minutes. How can one make amends for themselves once others may have forgiven them, but they have not forgiven themselves? Um, how do you make amends for yourself if you've done something really bad and others forgive you, but you cannot forgive yourself? Um, may that never be the case. You know, may whatever has happened in the past, may we be able to turn back to God. We have the story of the murderer who murdered 99 people. And then he came to the scholar, he was of the children of Israel, as you know, and he came to the scholar of the children of Israel, and he said, can God forgive me? And he said, no. And so he said, I'll make it 100. And he did. And then he went to another scholar who is described as knowing God, and he said, yes. Um, and then he said, but leave the city where you did the crimes and go to another city which is known for its uprightness. So that's very, very important right there. Leave that bad, bad company and go to good company. That will change you. That will make you a new man. And as you know from the hadith, which is one of the sahih, that the man set out for that other city of the righteous people and he died before he got there. And then we're told that the angels of wrath wanted him. He's a murderer. He murdered 100 people. Let us take him. And the angels of mercy wanted him. That no, he did repentance. And then they say that God sent a messenger to arbitrate and said, measure the distance. And if he's closer to the old city, let the angels of wrath take him. And if he's closer to the other city, let the angels of mercy take him. And it's said that God even shortened the distance to the city of the good people so that he was taken by the angels of mercy. So we must believe in God's forgiveness. And we must believe that he removes all sins. Um, and we hope that none of us will be obstructed by that. But when you do do things wrong, and every one of us does, um, if we go through our lives, even as people that have done tawbah and that are on the path, we have times of failure. We have times of defeat. We have times when you know, we were doing dhikr and we were getting up and praying, and then we don't do it. Right? Our hearts become hard, and we may feel very bad about that. And sometimes people even um, go back almost to where they were before. Sometimes they do go back to where they were before. So we have fetra, we have times of weakness, and we have times of failure. And in the spiritual path, those are all sayyat that you want to turn into hasanat. And one of the ways that you do that is never forget them. And always remember that this is who I am. I'm not this great person that does dhikr and prays. No, I'm that bad person who didn't do dhikr and didn't pray. So what do I have to be proud of? And also, <clears throat> what power do I have to produce my own salvation? I don't. What if God were to will that I would backtrack in the last moments of my life? It was possible then. It's not going to be possible at that time. It is possible, isn't it? May that never happen. That's why we pray that it never happen. But, you know, the bad deeds that we've done, we want to always remember so that they keep us humble. 
And when we do that, that bad deed then can become a hasana because of the fact that it enables you now to worship God purely, you know, with no sense of ego, no sense of accomplishment, with a sense of failure, that who am I after all? Never forget, I'm the one who failed. And the fact that I got back up on my feet, then, you know, don't be deluded by that. It's said about Pharaoh that nothing ever went wrong for him ever. He always had what he wanted. He always accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. This is one of the things that made him a tyrant. This is one of the things that made him believe that he was uh, the high, your highest Lord. And in fact, if God had made him sick, if God had made him fail, he probably could have never been Pharaoh. To be Pharaoh, he had to be that person who outwardly was perfect handsome, strong, beautiful. He succeeds at everything he does. He is Pharaoh. If he commands you, you better obey. So um, our failures are actually successes, especially on the spiritual path. We have to be honest about ourselves, and we don't want to ever forget the, the failures that we have. Sometimes people commit crimes which are unspeakable. <clears throat> Do they make toba? God does whatever he wills. Um, look at great Sayyid Umar ibn al-Khattab. Okay. What did he do to his daughter? He buried his daughter alive, didn't he? And we let's not even tell the story. You've probably heard it. It'll make you cry. Okay. Do you think he ever forgot, forgot that? Not his whole life. Did he regret it? To the depths of his being. And she haunted him. He could still see her. Because she thought he was playing. And he was burying her alive. And she's smiling at him. He never forgave himself for that. You know? And this is one of the things that makes him Umar al Farooq. So, this evil deed that he did in Jahiliyyah, this is one of the things that will make him one of the greatest human beings who ever was. And, you know, I became a Muslim through Malcolm X. Um, you know, if you ever studied the life of Malcolm X, you read his autobiography. Um, I mean, he's a, he's a product of the institutional racism of my country. And that is evil. It is evil. And uh, he was such a gifted person, but he was warped by that institutional racism. And, you know, he became... He, he, got, he became a, a drug dealer, he became a robber, uh, he did all kinds of things. When he went to prison, uh, they called him Satan. And again, just like with other people that turned the page, Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad is another one we mentioned. One of the things that makes Malcolm Malcolm is the fact that he never was filled with himself. Because he knew that God made him. God gave him himself back. Islam made him. And that if it weren't for the sheer mercy of God, he would have been killed. He would have been shot down. He would have died in prison years and years ago. So his memory of that, you know, um, and Islam removes what went before it. But his memory of that is what made him so thankful to God and made him so strong in everything that he did. I think we need to stop now, right? Allahumma wafiqna lima tuhibbuhu wa tarda wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa amitna ala kalimati al-huda alimna ma yanfa'una wa wafiqna lil'amali bima alamtana bih wa ja'al ma nahnu fihi khalisan mukhlisan li wajhika al-kareem ya rabbil alameen اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار and hopefully we see you tomorrow and tomorrow is the last session pray for me that I can bring it off okay and tomorrow we're going to talk about giving reality a voice in the world we're going to talk about things like where did the Sufis get their knowledge? 
what kind of knowledge did they have, the metaphysical knowledge they had, what are the palaces that they built with that, and um, pray that we have a good conclusion, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum.